the Columbia Broadcasting System presents the Mercury Theater on the Air. Gentlemen, the star and director of the Mercury Theater, Orson Welles. Good evening. On Thursday, July 14th, at 2.29 in the afternoon, aviator Howard Hughes set his big twin-motored monoplane World's Fair 1939 down at Floyd Bennett Field for a new record in round-the-world flying. From takeoff to landing, the trip of almost 15,000 miles took just three days, 19 hours and 17 minutes. That was about three months ago. But back in the 1870s, so Jules Verne tells us, a group of English gentlemen made a wager on what they were confident was a sure thing. Their clubmate, Phileas Fogg, had the fantastic notion that a man traveling from west to east could get around the world in 80 days. His attempts, as I think you'll agree, remain at the least more incredible than Mr. Hughes' achievements. And that's the story of adventure and breakneck speed that Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air bring to life for us tonight. Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days with Orson Welles as Phileas Fogg. <laughs> My name is Phileas Fogg. Oui, monsieur. I will tell you of my personal habits and what I require of a servant. Oui, monsieur. I am a man of simple taste, without relatives or family. I have my tea and toast at 23 minutes after 8, my shaving water at 37 minutes after 9. I dress at 20 minutes after 10. At 12 o'clock, you will serve me my lunch, consisting of a boiled fish with redding sauce of the finest quality, a slice of roast beef garnished with mushrooms, a rhubarb and gooseberry tart, and a piece of Cheshire cheese. The whole washed down with two cups of tea. With my lunch, I read the London Times. At a quarter to four, you will bring me the evening standard. At five minutes to six, you will bring me my hat and cane. I dine at the Reform Club. At midnight, you will serve me a glass of ale and a chicken sandwich. Really? You see that the duties of my servant are not arduous. My present servant has been with me for four years. I've been forced to dismiss him. He brought me my shaving water this morning at a temperature of 84 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 86. That is an unpardonable offense. You understand? Oui, monsieur. You are a Frenchman and your name is Jean. Jean, if it does not displease, monsieur. Jean Passepartout. To be frank, I have had several trades. I have been a traveling singer, a circus rider, a vaulter like Leotard, a dancer on the rope like Blondin. I have been a professor of gymnastics, and I was sergeant fireman at Paris. I have among my papers notes of remarkable fires. Now, wishing to settle down, and having learned that Monsieur Phileas Fogg is the most exact and most settled gentleman in the United Kingdom, I have presented myself to Monsieur with the hope of living tranquilly with him. You are well recommended to me. You understand my conditions? Yes, sir. What time have you? Uh, Fifty-two minutes after five. Hmm. That is a fine, large silver watch you have, but it is slow. Pardon, monsieur, that is impossible. You are four minutes slow. It does not matter. It suffices to note the difference. Then, from this moment, 56 minutes after 5 o'clock p.m., Wednesday, October 2nd, 1872, you're in my service. And now bring me my hat and cane. It's time for me to get to my club. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Fogg. Hmm. 
The heart. My lead, I believe. And my trick. 55,000 pounds. Hmm. That's a lot of money. One of the directors of the Bank of England. What about it, Stuart? Well, the bank will write that off as a total loss, I suppose. I believe, on the contrary, we shall quite soon put our hands on the thief. Detectives, the most skillful in the world, have been sent to America and the continent, to all the principal ports. They're very difficult for the men to escape. <laughs> Queen of Spades. Nitric, I think. Have you a description of the thief? He's not a thief. What? He's not a thief. The man has extracted 55,000 pounds in banknotes in broad daylight from the paying room of the Bank of England. <laughs> in of hearts. I don't think so. I trump you. The Morning Chronicle assures us he's a gentleman. The actual moment that the package of banknotes was stolen, our cashier was occupied in registering a receipt for three shillings and sixpence. His eyes couldn't be everywhere, but he had, before that time, noticed a well-dressed gentleman of good manners and distinguished air going in and out of the paying room. You have a very accurate description of it. I still believe that the chances are in favor of the thief. Seems to be a very skillful and determined fellow. There's no single country in the world in which he can take refuge. Nonsense. Where do you suppose he might go? Mm, I don't know about that. After all, the world is big enough. Was once upon a time. Your turn to cut, sir. How oh, once upon a time. Has the world grown smaller by any chance? Without doubt. I agree with Mr. Bob. The world has grown smaller. Since we can go round it today in ten times quicker than we could a hundred years ago. Now, in this robbery case, that's what will make the search more rapid. Mm, we'll make the escape of the thief easier, sir. Your lead, Mr. Stewart. Diamonds are trumped. Just because it's possible now to go around the world in three months. In 80 days, sir. Since the Great Indian Peninsula Railway has opened its new section between Osaga and Ahalabad, one can go around the world in 80 days. Now, I have here a calculation made by the Morning Chronicle. Uh, London to Suez by rail and steamer, seven days. Suez to Bombay, steamer, 13 days. Bombay to Calcutta, rail, three days. Calcutta to Hong Kong, steamer, 13 days. Hong Kong to Yokohama, steamer, six days. Yokohama to San Francisco, steamer, 22 days. San Francisco to New York, rail, seven days. New York to London, steamer and rail, nine days. Total, 80 days. Yes, but that makes 80 days. Not include bad weather, contrary winds, shipwrecks, railroad accidents, etc. It includes everything. Even if the Hindus or the Indians tear up the rails, if they stop the trains, plunder the cars, or scout the passengers... It includes everything. Two trumps. Well, theoretically, all right, Mr. Fogg, but practically... Practically also, Mr. Stewart. Uh, I'd like very much to see you do it. Depends only on you. Have a start together. Ah, oh, heaven forbid, Mr. Fogg. I willingly wager uh, 4,000 pounds of such a journey... Made under these conditions is impossible. On the contrary, it is quite possible. Well, do it then. Go around the world in 80 days? Yes. I'm willing. When? At once. Only I warn you, Mr. Stewart, I shall do it at your expense. Gentlemen, this is folly. Let's continue our game. Your lead, Mr. Fogg. See it again, please. Well, there's a missed deal. Oh, Mr. Fogg, I'm taking you up. I wager 4,000 pounds. Oh, my dear Stewart, you're not serious, are you? When I use the word wages, it's always serious. Very well. I have 20,000 pounds deposited with Bering Brothers. I'm willing to risk them. 20,000 pounds. 20,000 pounds of the slightest unforeseen delay may make you lose. The unforeseen does not exist. But, Mr. Fogg, this period of 80 days is calculated only as a minimum. A minimum well employed is always sufficient. It means you must jump mathematically from the trains into the steamers and from the steamers onto the trains. I shall jump. Mathematically. No, I'm joking. A true Englishman never jokes when so serious a matter as a wager is in question. Gentlemen, I bet 20,000 pounds against who will that I will go around the world in 80 days or less. That is in 1920 hours or 115,200 minutes. Do you accept? Yes, we accept. Yes. Very well. The Dover boat starts at 8.45. I should take it. This very evening? This very evening. Today is Wednesday, the 2nd of October. I must be back in London in this very card room of the Reform Club, Pell-Mell, on Saturday, the 21st of December, at 8.45 p.m., in default of which the £20,000 at present deposited to my credit with Bering Brothers will be yours, gentlemen. In fact, and by right. Here is a check. Check for the full amount. Fogg, you're taking the 8.45 train for Dover... 
Would you not like to stop the game now and make your preparations? I'm always prepared, sir. Stand for trumps. Your lead, Mr. Stewart. <laughs> Passe two. Passe two. Oui, monsieur. Passe two, it is the second time that I have called you. But it is not midnight, monsieur. I do not expect... I know it, and I do not find fault with you. Prepare yourself. We leave in ten minutes. No trunks are necessary, only a carpet bag. In it, two woolen shirts and three pairs of stockings. The same for you. We will purchase on the way. You may bring down my Macintosh and traveling cloak, also stout shoes... Although we will walk but little or not at all. Also take this bag and take good care of it. There are 20,000 pounds in it. But yes? Monsieur is thinking of leaving home? Yes, Passepartout. We are going around the world. <laughs> Dover. It's now 11.22. We've gained 40 seconds already. Monsieur. Yes? Monsieur, I have just remembered that terrible thing. Yes, what is it? In my haste, monsieur, in my disturbed state of mind, I have forgot... <gasps> Mon Dieu! Forgot what? To turn off the gas in the kitchen, it will burn! For 1920 hours, a gross piece of negligence which will be charged against your wages. The rate of two and one half cubic feet per hour and three farthings per cubic foot. On the day of our return, you will owe me exactly three shillings and tenpence farthing. <laughs> Saloon of the Reform Club, our bet didn't take long to find its way into the press. It was widely discussed and criticized. Some took sides at Phileas Fogg. The majority declared him a visionary. The Times, the Standard, the Evening Star, the Morning Chronicle, and eight other papers of large circulation declared against Mr. Fogg. The Daily Telegraph alone came out in his favor. Enormous bets were placed for and against him at Lloyd's and among private individuals. Bond was issued which was immediately listed on the London Stock Exchange. For a few days, the market in Phileas Fogg was firm above par. Enormous transactions were made. Five days after his departure, a long article appeared in the bulletin of the Royal Geographic Society. It treated the question from all points of view and demonstrated clearly the folly of the enterprise. The article made a great sensation. Phileas Fogg declined. Buyers were scarce. The odds against him rose from 5 and 10 to 1 to 20 to 1, 50, finally 100 to 1. At 9 o'clock on the 9th of October, a telegraphic dispatch arrived in London. Suez to London. Cowan, Commissioner of Police, Central Office, Scotland Yard. I have the bank robber, Phileas Fogg. Send without delay warrant of arrest to Bombay, British India. Detailed report follows by mail. And following him, signed six. Detective. Left London, Wednesday, October 2nd, 1845 p.m. Left Paris, Thursday, October 3rd, 8.40 a.m. Arrived Turin, Friday, October 4th, 6.35 a.m. Left Turin, Friday, 7.20 a.m. Arrived Brindisi, Saturday, October 4th, 4 a.m. Boarded Mongolia, Saturday, 5 p.m. Arrived at Suez, Wednesday, October 9th, 11 a.m. Two hours gained. Are you with Magistrate Thompson? I am. My name is Six. Detective of Scotland Yard, covering the port of Suez. Well, Mr. Six? Mr. Counsel, I have strong reason for believing that the man who robbed the Bank of England of 55,000 pounds has taken passage on board the Mongolia. Indeed, Mr. Fick. A Frenchman came up to me on the pier with a passport, which his master des- decided to have these aids. The description on this passport is identical with that which we received from the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. I told him that his master must present himself in person at your office to establish his identity. I shall be interested to see. That was a heavy robbery. A magnificent robbery. 55,000 pounds. And one-fifth of the money recovered for the man who apprehends him. Mr. Fix, I earnestly hope you are right. But from a mere cable description, do you not fear you may be mistaken? 
that this may be an honest man after all. Mr. Counsel, great robbers always resemble honest people. Honest faces are the very ones that must be unmasked. It is a difficult task. To solve such mysteries is not a trade so much as an art. We detectives feel these people rather than know them. If the man is what you suppose, I doubt if he will present himself at my office. A robber does not like to leave behind him the tracks of his passage. Mr. Counsel, if he is a shrewd man as I think, he will come. To have his passport visa? Yes. Passports serve only to incommode honest people and to aid the flight of rogues. I promise you that his passport will be in perfect order. But I hope you will not visa yet. And why not? If his passport is regular, I have no right to refuse my visa. But, Mr. Counsel, I must detain this man until I have received from London a warrant for his arrest. You have no proof, Mr. Fix. Mr. Counsel, you know who I am. You know I represent Scotland Yard. Do you think I would detain an innocent man? I am asking you to help me capture a man who has stolen 55,000 pounds. That, Mr. Fix, is your business, but I I, I cannot, as a Majesty's Counsel, legally... Um, come in. You're the Counsel, sir. I am. Here's my passport. May I ask you to visa it? Oh, you, uh, you are Phileas Fargus Square? Yes, sir. This man is your servant? Yes, a Frenchman named Passepartout. You come from London? Yes. And you are going? To Bombay. Well, sir, you know this formality of the visa is useless and that we no longer demand the presentation of a passport. I know it, sir, but I wish to prove by your visa my trip to Suez. Uh, very well, sir. Yeah. Here it is. I thank you, sir. Good day. Now then, will you admit, Mr. Counsel, that this phlegmatic gentleman resembles feature for feature the robber whose description I have re the, the, uh, received? I, I agree with you, but you know that all the script... I have a clear conscience in the matter. Since you will not help me, I shall take other steps. His servant appears to me less of a riddle than the master. Moreover, he is a Frenchman who cannot keep from talking. I shall not let him out of my sight. I shall follow them to the wharf. I shall follow them to Bombay. If necessary, I shall follow them round the world. <laughs> To West to London, Commissioner of Police, Scotland Yard. I have bank robber Phileas Fogg. Send without delay, warrant of arrest. Bombay. Fix, detective. From Suez to Bombay, voyage uneventful. Fogg leaves his cabin only to play whist, plays 30 rubbers a day. No chance to speak to him. French servant, more communicative. Have exchanged several drinks with him. Says his master carries an enormous sum of money with him and fresh new banknotes. He has promised 1,000 pounds to chief engineer if he makes Bombay two days ahead of time. Bombay to London. Commissioner of Police, Scotland Yard. Arrived Bombay two days early. Warrant not here. Following bank thief to Calcutta. Send warrant there. Six. Detective. <laughs> Thank you, monsieur. Yes? Monsieur, it is a calamity. Explain yourself. Monsieur, we are stopped. There is no more railway. Conductor. Sir? Yes? Conductor, where are we? A circus, sir, where the railway ends. This railroad is not finished. No, sir. The papers announced the opening of the entire line three weeks ago. Uh, the papers were mistaken, sir. From a circus to Allah Harbour, the tracks are not finished. Passengers must be otherwise transported. Monsieur, what a calamity. This delay will ruin us. It was provided for. We have gained two days, which we can afford to lose. The steamer leaves Calcutta for Hong Kong at midnight on the 25th. This is only the 23rd. We shall arrive at Allahabad tomorrow and Calcutta on the following day. How far is it from here to Allahabad? Mm, Eighty miles, sir. How may one get there? Mm, there are many ways, sir. Four-wheel turn Harris, Ebu Kat, Palanquin... How long does it take to reach Allahabad by these methods? Two days, sir. Perhaps three. Uh, too long. Is there no faster means of transport? No, sir. Think. Well, there's only one thing. You can go from here to Allahabad in less than two days, and that is not obtainable. What is it? An elephant, sir. Thank you. I shall acquire an elephant. Uh, Ten pounds an hour. No, sir. Fifteen pounds. Hire my elephant, Your Honor. I could not consider it. His name is Kiuni. He is an elephant of combat. Very swift and very strong. Thirty pounds. But no, sir. Forty pounds. But for so small a sum, sir, I cannot let him out of my sight. He is my only treasure, Your Honor. 
How do I know I should ever see him again? Then I will buy him from you. <laughs> it is not possible. I will give you a thousand pounds. Oh, Sahib, for such a beast, that is nothing. Twelve hundred. No, sir. Fifteen hundred. Sir, I love him as though he were my own child. Eighteen hundred. I am not a greedy man, Your Honor. Your Honor, Two thousand but... pounds. I cannot refuse a favor to so noble a gentleman. Sab, you may have my beast, and I will be your guide. Pass for two. Oui, monsieur. The carpet bag. We start at once. Mr. Farr. Mr. Farr. Sir? Uh, Mr. Farr, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is... Mr. Uh, Fix, I believe. It is indeed, sir. Though it surprises me that you know it. I always know the names of my fellow passengers. Can I be of service to you, sir? Mr. Fogg, you have acquired this elephant, the only one within 20 miles. That is correct, sir. And with it, you hope to reach Allahabad tomorrow? I do, sir. Then I beg you, sir. I'm in as great a hurry to reach Calcutta as yourself. If only you will permit me to accompany you, I shall be more than happy. Detective Fix to Commissioner of Police, Scotland Yard. October 23rd, left a server. 11.30 a.m. on elephant back. Phineas Fogg in one of the houses, I in the other. The French servant between us astride the animal. The posse guide perched on the elephant's neck. At nightfall, we entered the jungle, proceeding at a steady, rapid pace. As we proceeded, the forest grew denser. Fog is untidy. The man is made of iron. Towards morning, we entered the territory of Bundelkund, Allahabad now only 12 miles to the northeast. At a little before two, the elephant, showing signs of uneasiness, suddenly stopped. Yoni, back that! Uh, why does he stop? I do not know, sir. I will see. Salati Giuni. Ramin, sir. It's very dangerous. They come towards us. He must remain still. If the elephant is hidden behind these trees, they will not see us. Salati. came the priests with mitres on their heads. Behind them in a car with large wheels was a statue with four arms. Its body colored dark red, its eyes haggard, its hair tangled, its tongue hanging out, its lips covered with henna and beetle. Around its neck was a collar of skulls, around its waist a girdle of human hands. Uh, what is that statue they're dragging? Kali, the Hindu goddess of love and death. Of death, perhaps. Of love, never. That's the ugly old witch. No, in my conscience. her along. A young woman, half conscious, deathly pale. Her neck, her shoulders, her ears, her arms, her hands, her toes were loaded down with jewels, necklaces, bracelets, earrings, and finger rings. Behind her were guards armed with naked sabers, carrying the body of an old man dressed in silk and gold. They disappeared among the trees. Uh, tell me, what is Sati? That tea, Saab, is a human sacrifice. The woman you have just seen will be burned to death tomorrow in the early part of the day on the funeral pyre of her husband. Burned alive or the villain? Yes, Saab. This corpse then was her husband? Yes, Saab. The prince, her husband. The Raja of Bandelkand. As a child, they betrothed her to him. She has never seen him. In Allahabad, they sent her. Where are they taking her? to the pagoda of Tenaji, two miles from here. There she will pass the night in waiting for the sacrifice. Mm. And this sacrifice will take place? At the first appearance of day. Mm. There will be no sacrifice. We will save this woman. Save her? I have still 12 hours to spare. I can devote them to her. Bravo, monsieur, bravo. You are a man of heart. Uh, occasionally, Pastor, to occasionally. When I have the time. Waited for nightfall. Half past twelve reached the pagoda of Pelagi. Found it heavily guarded. We can do nothing before dawn, sir. We will wait. You know, sir, that we not only risk our lives, but, but horrible punishment if we are taken. I know that. 
We will wait. What good gad, Mr. Paul? Didn't you say you must reach... Mr. Uh... Fix, it will do if I reach Allahabad tomorrow before noon. We will wait. Little before dawn, men began to move in the pagoda. The hour had come in which the unfortunate woman was to die. Beside me stood Phileas Fogg. His face was white and drawn. The French servant had vanished. The doors of the pagoda were now opened. An intense light came from the inside. We could see the victim all lighted up, being dragged by two priests to the outside. She seemed to be drugged. In Phileas Fogg's hand, I saw the glint of an open knife crowd began to move towards the river. There stood the funeral pyre with the Rajah's body. In the half-light, we could dimly see the victim motionless, stretched beside her husband's corpse. A torch was brought. Then there took place a most extraordinary occurrence. <laughs> the dead Rajah moved. He was seen suddenly rising upright, like a phantom, raising the young woman in his arms. Descending from the pyre amidst clouds of smoke, he advanced rapidly towards us. Between the lines of Brahmins, groveling on the earth with terror. Now he was only a few yards off. Quick, quick, my master! Pass for two! Quick, 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 run before they see! Pass, Lord! A few bullets flew around us, and an arrow pierced Phileas Fogg's hat. Soon we were out of range. At 11.45, we entered the streets of Al Hubbard. The young woman... We had rescued from death, they still unconscious, in the arms of Phileas Fogg. Calcutta to London, Commissioner of Police, stop to the yard. October 25th, 4 p.m. Had Phileas Fogg and Prince David arrested today, charge of abducting Indian princess. Rush warrant for arrest on bank robbery charges. Six detectives. Calcutta to London, October 25th, 11, 10 p.m. Phileas Fogg and servant freed on payment of £1,000 fine. Sailing Hong Kong tonight with Indian princess. And following them. Rush warrant, Hong Kong. Six detectives. Hong Kong to London, November 7th. Warrant received too late. Fogg left for San Francisco tonight aboard special charter. Following him. Arrange expedition proceeding San Francisco. Six. Detective. San Francisco to London. Commissioner of Police Scotland Yard. Phileas Fogg, French servant and Indian princess, arrived in San Francisco December 1st. Leaving 6 p.m. for New York. Advise Her Majesty's Council, New York, arrange expedition. Six. Detective. Salt Lake City to London, December 5th. Traveling, same train as Fogg and Party. Have him under constant surveillance. Six. Detective. You are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in an original adaptation of Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. The performance will continue after a moment's intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days as adapted for radio by Orson Welles and performed by the Mercury Theater on the Air. Oh, bon Dieu, bon, bon, what a country is this America? December 3rd, we leave San Francisco. There are men fighting in the streets. They are electing a justice of the peace. December 5th, 12,000 buffaloes stand on the railroad. We cannot proceed for three hours. December 6th, at Great Salt Lake, 3,000 feet over the sea, won't you? Tonight, we will be in Omaha. We are in the 65th day of our journey. By the calculations of my master, Phileas Fogg, we are not behind and we are not before. Between Hong Kong and Yokohama, we have lost the day. But on the Pacific Ocean, we have caught it up. This man, my master, is mad. Of that there is no doubt. 
It is not permitted to a man of sound mind to pass his life in jumping from a steamer into a railway car, from a railway car into a steamer. And already from the carpet bag he has taken for ships, for trains, for fines, for bribes, for elephants, more than 7,000 pounds. If he loses bet, surely he is ruined. But he gives no sign. With us, always, goes Monsieur Fix. This one I do not like. Surely he is spying upon my master. Always he is asking me questions. I tell him nothing. With us also goes the beautiful princess Aouda. In India she is in danger of death. My master takes her with him to England. I do not understand. With a woman so beautiful. He is always so cold, so formal. Mon Dieu, these English. He has taught her to play whist. All day they sit. All day they play. Madam, your turn to cut. Hard that trumps, Mr. Fogg. Your lead, Mr. Fix. Uh, seven o'clock. Hmm. The train has stopped. Pass the two, come with me. We will see what has happened. Excuse me, madam. Engineer, what is this? Why do we stop? Well, there's medicine post, sir. Word just come through. The bridge is shaking. Can't pass. And uh, what do you propose to do? Well, I couldn't say, sir. Guess we're stuck. Bridge shaky won't bear the weight of the train. We will not, I suppose, remain here and take root in the snow. We've telegraphed Omaha for a train. It'll be six hours at least before it gets here. Uh, cannot the river be crossed in a boat? No, it can't be done. Crick swollen with the rain should never make it. Make it? I fail to understand. I have contracted with the Central Pacific Railroad to convey me from San Francisco to Chicago. I demand that the Central Pacific Railroad fulfill its contract. In addition to that, here is 100 pounds. Well. The present rate of exchange, $483.22, if I am in Omaha tonight. Well, <clears throat> there might be a way, passing. On the bridge? Yeah, on the bridge. Uh, with our train? Yeah, with our train. But the bridge threatens to fall, Monsieur Fogg. Nonsense. Well, it's my idea that by rushing the train over at full speed, we have a chance of passing. <laughs> now, how much chance? Mm. Forty percent, maybe fifty. Hmm. What are we waiting for? Come, Passepartout. Let us return to our whist game and to the Princess Aouda. I left a very interesting hand. Then comes a terrible moment. The train stops. First, she goes back. And then, she goes past the breach. Faster. Faster and faster. We are at the bridge. <laughs> ah, we are crossed. Good heavens. What was that? Sacre Dieu. That was the bridge falling behind us. I think we shall win this hand, Mr. Fix. <laughs> December 8th. Arrived Medicine Bow. December 8th. Attacked by Red Indians. Arrived Fort Kearney, 7 a.m., 20 hours behind time. December 8th. Left Fort Kearney, 8 a.m., by ice sled. December 9th. Arrived Omaha, 3 p.m., 14 hours behind time. December 10th. Arrived Chicago, 4 p.m., 8 hours behind time. Left Chicago, 4.30 p.m., by special train. December 11th. Arrived New York, 9.35 a.m. Steamship China sailed 9.10. We've missed it. Officer, officer, when does the next ship sail? Well, the Perrier leaves on December 14th, sir. And uh, arrives in England when? It doesn't go to England. It lands in Havre December the 24th, sir. Is there any vessel which arrives in England by December 21st? None, sir. Then I must arrange that one shall. Come, Passepartout, and bring the carpet bag. Ah, uh, you the captain? 
captain of this ship? I am. I am Phileas Fogg of London. I am Andrew Speedy of Cardiff. Excellent. Are you ready to sail? In an hour. You are loaded for... Bordeaux. Your cargo? Gravel. You have passengers? No passengers. Never have passengers. A cargo that talks too much. Your vessel sails swiftly? Between 11 and 12 knots. The Henrietta, well known, sail and steam. Do you wish to convey me to Liverpool, myself and three persons? To Liverpool? Why not to China? I said Liverpool. No. No? No, I'm setting out for Bordeaux. It doesn't matter what price? It don't matter what price. Uh, but the owners of the Henrietta... The owners of the Henrietta are myself. The vessel belongs to me. I will charter it from you. No. No? I will buy it from you. No. No. Where will you take me to Bordeaux? No, not even if you paid me $200. I offer you 2000 For each person? For each person. And there are four of you? Four. I leave at nine o'clock. It is half past eight. At nine o'clock, we will be on board. Commissioner of Police, Scotland Yard, New York to London. Sailing tonight with bank robber Phileas Fogg on board steamship Henrietta, bound Bordeaux. This time, positively, he will not escape me. Fixed. Detective. December 11th, off Sandy Hook at midnight, past Fire Island Light, and headed east at three quarter speed, making nine knots. December 13th. At noon, vessel suddenly changed course, heading northeast. Speed increased to twelve and a half knots. Captain, nowhere to be seen. Phileas Fogg at the helm. No whist has been played since we started. Indian Princess remains below. December 14th. Find Captain missing. Detect curious attitude in crew. Last night heard strange noises in focuser. In the afternoon, barometer fell. Still no sign of Captain. December 15th. Discover Captain has been locked in his cabin for two days. Crew heavily bribed. Vessel no longer headed Bordeaux, but unknown destination. Running into heavy weather. Late this evening, overheard conversation on deck between Fogg and Chief Engineer. Everything now clear. You are certain of what you say, Engineer? I'm certain, sir. Don't forget that since our departure, all our furnaces have been going. And although we had enough coal to go under a small head of steam from New York to Bordeaux, we've not enough for a full head of steam from New York to Liverpool. I will take this matter under consideration. Uh, pass for two. Oui, monsieur. Go below and bring up the captain. Monsieur, I fear I shall find a madman. Do as I say. Oui, monsieur. Engineer, you will keep up your fires and continue on your course until the complete exhaustion of the fuel. Don't let the fires go down. On the contrary, let the fire continue full. Where is he? Where ah. is he? Good evening, Captain. Oh, you scoundrel. Captain Speedy, you will forgive me for uh. any slight inconvenience I have caused you, but you are an obstinate man and my business is urgent. Pirate, where are we? 770 miles from London. Sea skimmer! What have you done with my ship? I have sent for you, Captain, to ask you to sell it to me. No! By all the devils, no! Then I shall be obliged... To burn her. To burn my ship? Her upper portions, for we are out of fuel. To burn my ship? A ship that's worth $50,000? I offer you $60,000. Oh, mighty heaven. Well, Captain, what do you say? And the iron hull will be left? The iron hull and the engine, sir. Is it a bargain? A uh, bargain. Pass for two. Yes. The carpet bag. Captain Speedy here is your money. Count it, please, and don't let all this astonish you. Uh, know that I shall lose 20,000 pounds if I'm not in London on the 21st of December at quarter before nine in the evening. This ship is now mine? Certainly. From keel to the truck of the mast. All the wood. All the wood she carries. Very well, Captain Speedy. You may resume command of your ship. Dismantle the furniture and fire up the debris. <laughs> Deck, cabins, the bunks, the spare deck were burned today. Reached speed of 13 knots. December 19th, drops, knots, and spars consumed. December 20th, the railings and remaining portions of the deck fed to the furnace. At 7 in the evening, sighted coast of Ireland fast at light. At 10 o'clock, arrived off Queenstown. Mr. Fogg. Yes, Captain. Mr. Fogg, you're a brave man. Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, I pity you. Everything is against you. You have 24 hours in which to reach London, and yet we are only off Queenstown, and there's no more wood. Is that Queenstown where I perceive the light? Yes. Can we enter the harbor? Not for three hours, only at high tide. Very well. We will wait. 
At one in the morning, what was left of the Henrietta entered Queenstown Harbour. We landed immediately. At 1.30, we boarded a train, arrived at Dublin at dawn, embarked on the Liverpool packet. At 20 minutes before noon, the 21st of December, Phileas Fogg finally landed on the quay at Liverpool. He was now only nine hours from London. At this moment, with what I must admit was a heavy heart, I approached him and put my hand on his shoulder. Sir? You are really Phileas Fogg? Yes, sir. Then with this warrant, in the name of the Queen, I arrest you. Ah, mon Dieu, mon Dieu. So, on the 80th day of his tour around the world, only nine hours from London, with three hours and five minutes to spare and 20,000 pounds at stake, my master is imprisoned here in the custom house at Liverpool. I am desolate. It is snowing. Mon Dieu, what shall I do? All morning we wait. On the porch of the custom house where we wait, it is damp and cold. But Madame Aouda will not desert my kind master, who sits inside alone. What will become of him? The last train for London leaves at two o'clock. Alas, I fear my master is ruined. Ah, mon Dieu. The last train has left. Ah, yes, madame. This is truly the end. <sighs> Mr. Park! Mr. Park, madame! Pass for two. What is it, scoundrel? I have made a mistake, a terrible thing. Quickly, quickly, come with me. Hurry, or your master will be ruined. Oh, Mr. Park. Oh, Mr. Park, forgive me. Sir? Oh, pardon me, sir, pardon. I made a terrible mistake, a dreadful error, an unfortunate resemblance, sir. You are not the robber. You are not the robber. The robber was arrested in Edinburgh this morning. You may go, sir. You are free. Then my master does a wonderful thing. He wastes five seconds. He goes to the detective. He looks him well in the face. And then, with the only rapid movement he has ever made in his life, he draws both his arms back. And then, with the precision of an automaton, with both his fists, he strikes. Take that, sir. <laughs> We jump into a carriage, and in five minutes we are at the station. It is 40 minutes past two. Phileas Fogg orders a special train. Six hours and 20 minutes later, we are in London. As we enter the station, the clocks are striking. My friends, I've been around the world in 80 days and 15 minutes. I've lost. My master is ruined. With my own eyes in these 80 days, I have watched him spend more than 19,000 pounds of his money. The carpet bag is flat and empty. And tomorrow, the gentlemen of the Reform Club will cash their cheque for 20,000 at Bering Brothers. Sadly, this evening, we return to the house in Saville Row. In the kitchen, the gas is still burning. Our neighbors do not know we have returned. The doors and the windows of the house are kept closed. Sadly, I cook the dinner. Sadly, I prepare an apartment for the Princess Aouda. Sadly, I tell her the truth. But for my master, as a man of honor, there is only one course open. Passepartout, we must do something to prevent it. Madame, I can do nothing by myself, nothing at all. I have no influence over my master's mind. But you, perhaps... What influence would I have? Mr. Fogg is subject to none. Has he ever understood that my gratitude for him was overflowing? Has he ever read my heart? 
My friend, you must not leave him for a single instant. The night passes. Monsieur Fogg has retired, but has he slept? I have watched like a dog at my master's feet all night till morning. I have heard him restlessly pacing the floor. You called, sir? I did. You will prepare the Princess Aouda's breakfast. For myself, I will be satisfied with a cup of tea and a piece of toast. You will beg her to be good enough to excuse me from luncheon and dinner. I have certain affairs to set in order. You will say that I would like to see her in the library at eight o'clock. Then you will not go to the club today, monsieur? No. My master, I wish you to know that whatever happens, I shall always... Go. I have desired to speak with you this evening, madame, in order to beg your forgiveness. Mine, sir. Can you ever forgive me, madam, for having brought you to England? I, Mr. Fogg? Be kind enough to allow me to finish. When I thought of taking you so far away from that country which had become so dangerous for you, I was rich. And I counted on placing a portion of my fortune at your disposal. Your life would have been happy and free. But now, madam, as you know, I'm ruined. I can no longer... I know it, Mr. Fogg. And I, in turn, ask you, will you pardon me for having followed you? And who knows, for having perhaps assisted in your ruin by delaying you? Madam, you could not remain in India. And your safety was only assured by removing you so far that those fanatics could not retake you. But, Mr. Fogg, was it not enough that you should rescue me from a horrible death without feeling that you were obliged to assure my position abroad? It would have been my pleasure, madam... Events have turns against me. However, I ask your permission to dispose of the little I have left in your favor. But you, Mr. Fogg, what will become of you? I, madam, shall not need anything. But how, sir, do you look upon the fate that awaits you? As I ought to look at it. Whatever the future holds for you, so kind a man as you could never be in want, I am sure. Your friend. I have no friends, madam. Your relatives. I have no relatives. I pity you, Mr. Fogg. Solitude is a sad thing. Is there not one heart into which you can pour your troubles? They say that with two, misery itself is bearable. They say so, madam. Mr. Fogg, you will not think me bold if I ask you whether you might wish at once a relative and a friend. Will you have me for your wife? You close your eyes, Mr. Fogg. Will you not look at me and answer my question? I love you. Yes, in truth. By everything most sacred in the world, I love you. And I am yours. Ah, my friend. Did you ring, sir? Passe two. Oui, monsieur. You will notify the Reverend Samuel Wilson of Mary de Bon Parish of our intention to be married as soon as possible. Bon, monsieur. It is not too late to go now, is it? Never too late, monsieur. It will be for tomorrow, Monday. For tomorrow, Monday, my dear. For tomorrow, Monday. Yes, monsieur. Yes, madame. <laughs> Gentlemen, in 15 minutes, the time agreed upon between Phileas Fogg and ourselves will have expired. Uh, at what hour did the last train arrive from Liverpool? Twenty-three minutes after seven, and the next train doesn't arrive till after midnight. Mm, gentlemen, if Phileas Fogg had arrived on the train at twenty-three minutes after seven, he would already be here. We can therefore consider we have won the bet. I wouldn't be too sure, gentlemen. Mr. Fogg is an eccentric of the first order. His punctuality is a byword. Never arrives too late or too soon. He'll appear here at the very last minute, or I shall be very much surprised. Let's continue our game, gentlemen. No deal, Flanagan. This is the rubber game. He has 11 minutes. Monsieur! Monsieur! What's the matter, Passepartout? Monsieur, the marriage is impossible. Impossible? 
impossible? What do you mean? What stands in the way? Impossible tomorrow, sir. Explain yourself, Passepartout. It is impossible tomorrow, monsieur. Tomorrow is Sunday. Monday, Passepartout. Today is Saturday, monsieur. Have you lost your mind? Today is Sunday. Yes, sir. Today is Saturday. Saturday? Impossible. Yes, 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 yes. You have made a mistake of one day. We have arrived 24 hours in advance. Today is Saturday, the 21st. We have 10 minutes. We have won. We have failed. 10 minutes. Nine of hearts. Nine of hearts. For my part, Mr. Ralph, I would not believe it was he if I saw him. China, the only steamer from New York that could be of any use to him, arrived yesterday. Name was not on the passenger list. Miffing the most favorable chances, Phineas Fogg has scarcely reached America. I calculate 20 days at least of the time he'll be behind. If, uh, that is, he is still alive. <laughs> this thing was senseless from the very start. However exact he may be, it is beyond human power to prevent the occurrence of inevitable delays, and, and a delay of only two or three days would be enough to, to destroy his chances. Tomorrow morning, we can present to Bearing Brothers Mr. Fogg's check for £20,000. Three minutes. Here, do, Stuart. Hots of trumps. Two of clubs. Ten of clubs? I trump you. Three of hearts. No trick, Stuart. One at one half minutes to go. Gentlemen, it is now 8.43 and a quarter. I propose we resume this game at 8.45 p.m. Gentlemen, we may safely congratulate ourselves. The bet is won. One minute, five seconds. Fifty seconds left. Forty. Twenty-five. Fifteen. Fourteen. Thirteen. Twelve. Eleven. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven, six, five, four, three, two. Good evening, gentlemen. It's a good wager. I'm afraid you've lost. If you don't mind, Mr. Phileas Fogg, that is Mr. Orson Wells... How did a man of your character happen to be on time when all along you thought you were a day late? Well, Mr. Seymour, it's this way. You know, speaking out of character, and as one of the least punctual of mortals, I am always happiest on the 79th day of the Jules Verne adventure. Here, for a blissful page or two, it does really look as though all my life's long list of trains missed and appointments forgotten may be finally justified in the delirious unlikelihood of Mr. Fogg losing his bet. We of the world who can't read timetables, wind watches, or get out of bed, we for whom traffic jams were made and for whom the alarm clock never rings, we more than any regard with benevolent suspicion those incidents which delayed the underlayable Englishman. To us, they are less like incidents than excuses. And the whole story is too good to be true. An alibi we'd never dare. At least, I'd never dare anything like this. Excuse me, old man, I tried to make it, but you see, there was an Oriental princess and a tribe of Red Indians, and then we had to burn up our ship on the way over for fuel. I'm sure you know how it is. Most annoying. Hope you'll forgive. As I say, it sounds like the ultimate, the magnificent alibi it ought to be, but... Oh, horror. There appears in the last chapter a Jules Verne nick in time. An unpredictable split infinity that flings the truth in our teeth and turns the timetables. And here our envy turns to loathing as we, who are always late, realize that the 81st day is actually the 80th. 
that the five minutes after midnight is really the eleventh hour, that Phileas Fogg made it and is lost to us. Well, Mr. Seymour, here's the solution. At a period when your grandfather saw the sun pass the meridian 80 times, Mr. Fogg, rushing precisely around the globe toward the sun, celebrated this solemn and unavoidable occasion 79 times only and gained a day. Myself, I don't understand it even after I've explained it. But you do, I'm sure. You who get there and keep nobody waiting. You probably guessed it before we began. just heard Orson Welles' original adaptation for radio of Jules Verne's classic Around the World in 80 Days. It was the 16th in the Columbia Broadcasting System's weekly dramatic series featuring Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air. In the cast tonight were Ray Collins as Mr. Fix, Edgar Barrier as Passepartout, 2, Eustace Wyatt as Ralph, Frank Rettick as Stewart, Arlene Francis as Madame Aouda, Stefan Schnabel as the Parsi, Al Swenson as the Captain, William Allen as the officer, and Orson Welles as Phileas Fogg. The original music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and Davidson Taylor supervised the production for CBS. This is Dan Seymour speaking. <laughs> War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, with Orson Welles as producer, director, and featured artist, supported by the Mercury Theater on the air. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.